Queens. Let's talk a little more about yeah. how this thing happened. Yeah, that's okay. No, 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 no. You're okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about how to raise a few queens. Uh, I, I get this, I don't know, I seem to get a lot of questions about this. There's, there's a lot of opinions out there on raising queens. Um, there's always this opinion that there's no other bees anywhere around me. Trust me, there are. You think there aren't, but you're mistaken. There are always bees out there. Um, there's this idea I'm going to end up with inbred queens because I only have two hives and I'm going to raise my own queens and they're all going to be inbred. The queen's likely to find a DCA out there with drones from all over the place. It's probably not an issue. Probably the sooner you get them to raise their own queen instead of that one you got in the package, the better chances you've got of surviving the winter. So um, you might want to do this um, if for no other reason than to take that package you've got and get them requeened with something that's got some local genetics in it. I know you think you want to start with this package queen, but she's going to go out there and mate with 20 or 30 drones from the local population, and then you'll be in much better shape, right? We already talked a little bit about the why, so I'll probably gloss some of this over, um, so maybe we can get through this a little quicker. But the, these are the these are the reasons why you might want to raise your own queens. Um, obviously, there's the cost. Uh, I you'd have trouble finding a queen for 20 bucks these days, and, and, it, and it'll be a really crappy queen, most likely. If you're not paying way more than that to somebody who's a local person who's not trading, you're probably not getting your money's worth. Um, there's always the time that you suddenly find that you think your bees are queenless. So let, well, actually, let me sidetrack on that for a minute. You, you go in, you find no eggs, no brood, and you go, oh, well, they taught me in D-class, that means I don't have a queen. Well, they lie. You probably do have a queen. Odds are there's a queen in there. Um, it's just not laying yet. So, is it possible they're queenless? Yes, it's possible. So you might want to hedge your bets and, and, and cover that possibility by taking a frame of open brood from some other hive and put it in there. And if they are queenless, they can raise a queen. And meanwhile, if they aren't queenless, you haven't interfered with the process of what's going on. Because probably what happened was they already swarmed and there's a queen getting ready to start laying. Or they superseded the old queen. Or you smashed her between a couple of end bars and didn't realize it and they've replaced her. And the new queen isn't laying yet, because from the time they start raising that new queen until she's laying is three or four weeks. So in that three or four weeks, every bit of brood in the hive has emerged. There's no new eggs yet. And you look in there and you go, oh, they're queenless. And you buy a queen and you put her in there and they kill her. And you buy another queen and you put her in there and they kill her. You buy another queen and you go put her in there and you go, oh, wait a minute, there's eggs in here. What happened? Well, but that queen who's been here all along is finally laying. Um, so probably you aren't queenless, but sometimes you really are, and if you really are, it's nice to be able to get a queen. And sometimes you spend weeks calling people trying to find somebody who even has a queen. Um, so there's the issue of how fast can I even find one, and, and can I even find one at all? So sometimes you can't even find one. Um, personally, I think it's foolish to keep buying queens from areas that are Africanized, because why do you want to get mean bees when you can get nice bees? Why not raise local bees? Now, if you live in an Africanized area, I'd recommend you probably try to get local feral bees and then cull them out for the, for the nice ones, because the fact is you bring European bees in, and then you get this nice F1 hybrid between the local ferals and, and that nice European queen, and you end up with these vicious bees. The Africanized bees, if, if, if what everybody shows me as Africanized bees in the Caribbean and Arizona and, and Texas and Florida, is what Africanized bees are like. They're all workable. I haven't seen any that weren't. But you get some F1 crosses that are not workable. They're just absolutely vicious. Um, I, I'd be raising local survivors and calling out the mean ones and trying to keep the nice ones. Because then you're not going to get those F1 hybrid crosses that are really vicious. But you probably don't have a, an issue with that. Your probably bigger issue is that you don't want to bring Africanized bees in here. Now there's the argument that they can't survive um, this far north, and I doubt that that's true, but I don't know. Um, then there's the obvious issues of disease resistance and mite resistance, which we already kind of talked about. I think the genetics of our queens is too important to be left to people who have no stake in their success. You know, we mentioned earlier the package bee industry really has no, no real incentive to give you packages that survive, because as long as your bees keep dying and you keep buying more packages, they're just selling more bees. So I'm not saying they're purposely trying to make your bees die. I don't. Think, I just don't think they care. I don't 
it matters to them. They're just trying to make packages and ship them out the door and sell them. Um, you, on the other hand, have, have a bigger stake in it than they do. And you can raise your own queens and raise your own bees and, and, and do better because you, you care about what you're trying to do. Um, obviously, there's the acclimatized thing. I'm sure the bees in this area are, are not going to build up at the same times and make the same decisions and do the same things as the bees where I live. The bees have to gamble and they have to, they have to predict when something's going to happen. So they have to predict when the flow is going to happen so they can build up a big population of bees to go gather that flow when it happens. It hasn't happened yet. Um, Michael Palmer made the point at a talk I heard once that he never realized that you could raise bees who would do that until he started raising his own queens. Up until then, he just assumed he'd do whatever they do and he'd have to stimulate them into raising brood at the right time to hit the flows. But when he started raising them from the ones that were building up at the right time to hit the flows, he got bees that would do that. And that's not really that hard to judge. If they're doing well, they're probably building up at the right times. Now, the only danger in that philosophy is they are gamblers and they may in one year gamble really big and get lucky um, and in another year they might gamble really big and get unlucky. You want bees with a little bit of common sense that are willing to gamble a reasonable amount on a reasonably good bet, you know, not the ones that are gambled big on a, on a long shot. So um, there's, a, there's a philosophy in bee breeding that you don't want to breed from the hives that are just unbelievably productive because there's, those are the ones that gambled big and got lucky, you know. If they hadn't got lucky, they would all starved. So you might want the ones that are, that are making more moderate, reasonable decisions instead of the outrageous decisions that sometimes pay off big. Um, but other than that, you can raise them that are more acclimatized to your area by bringing from the ones that in a normal year are doing well. You know, the ones that in a normal year do well are building up at the right times to do well. Um, and we talked a little about the quality. I think it's how soon they bank these queens that's the problem. They bank these queens before they've laid a few eggs and their ovarials don't develop very well. You can let them develop. You can make, if you're putting them in a mating nuke, you can leave them in a mating nuke for three or four weeks before you do anything with them. And then chances are you'll just introduce them directly to a hive where they're not getting banked at all. And uh, the other thing is you can put the queen cells in the hive you want to requeen and just let them emerge into that hive in the first place and they never get but any, they never get caged at all. They're just in the hive they're going to be in. And that's going to improve your uh, quality. So let's talk about some concepts here. Those are queen cells, by the way. It's amazing how many people would call those bottom ones swarm cells and those ones that are up in the middle some other kind of cell. But whatever they are, the bees are trying to do something. I'm amazed how many emails and, and, and forum things I respond to that somebody says, well, I have two swarm cells and three supersedure cells. <laughs> no, the bees are doing something. You need to figure out what they're doing. And what they're doing, the hints of, to, as to what they're doing is probably, it's probably better to look at the direction the hive is going and what, and what time of year it is and what's happening than to look at where the cells are. If the, if the hive is rapidly building up and there's lots of cells, I don't care where they are, they're probably swarm cells. If the hive's kind of dwindling and, and, and are stagnating, then they may be supersedure cells. They're sensing that the queen's not doing her job and they're going to replace her. So I'd look more at those kinds of contexts than I would at where the cells are. But anyway, those are all queen cells all the way up that middle, right up the middle there, there's a whole bunch of queen cells. Um, here's why, why bees raise queens. They either raise queens out of, out of an emergency because the queen died, um, the typical cause of a queen dying is that usually the beekeeper, because otherwise they usually sense she's getting old and going to fail and they replace her and they get rid of her. But, um, but uh, sometimes, you know, it's just bad luck and, and she does die. But they, that's an emergency when she dies. So suddenly there's no queen, they raise a new queen. Supersedure, they sense that the queen's failing. And that's usually based on pheromones. But I think it may also be based on the egg police are having to clean out a bunch of drone eggs that are in worker cells because she's running out of sperm. I think that may trigger it. Um, but whatever whatever it is, the supersedures, when they sense that she's failing and they decide that she needs to be replaced and they raise a new queen. Reproductive swarming, I've separated out from overcrowding swarming because 
I find two different scenarios that require different <coughs> strategies to keep them from swarming. If, if it's prime swarm season, the strategies I have to use to keep them from swarming are different than the strategies in the middle of the summer. In the middle of the summer, if I let them get overcrowded, they'll swarm, but as long as I throw some boxes on there, they'll probably be fine. But in prime swarm season, I've got to be more specific. I've got to open up a brood nest to keep them from swarming because they're pretty intent on doing it. And that seems to be a different motivation. That's a reproductive motivation. They want to reproduce the, the colony, where if you just let them get overcrowded, it's more of a matter of, well, we got too many mouths to feed. Some of you guys need to go. So, so they swarm. But all of these are reasons why they'll raise a queen. Um, now, if you're trying to raise queens, I think the, the situation you want to simulate is you want them to um, be in a position where they have to raise a queen because that's the biggest motivation. If they're queenless, they have to raise a queen. So you pretty much tip the scale where they're going to raise at least a queen. Um, if you also overcrowd them, then you accomplish a couple other things. You not only give them another motivation to raise more queens and to raise queens, but you've also given them more resources to feed those queens. You've got more bees to take care of those queen cells and to feed them and to, and to, and to make sure they're well nourished. Um, so if you can simulate both emergency and overcrowding, you, you can usually get them to raise a lot of queens, especially if you pick the right time of year. And I, I recommend if you're just trying to raise a few queens for yourself, pick the right time of year. Pick just before, just before and up to prime swarm season, that's a good time to raise some queens. There'll be lots of drones out there, they'll get well mated, there's lots of resources coming in so they'll get well fed. And if you crowd them really well, you can get some fairly well fed queens. Um, so what do you even do queen rearing? I mean, I can make a high queen unless they're going to raise, they're going to raise a bunch of queens, they're going to raise a queen, right? I can take this queen out, put her wherever I wanted that queen, and they'll raise another queen. That's true. So why, why do I want to do anything fancier than that? Well, the underlying concept is that I'm trying to get the most number of the highest quality queens from the least resources and probably from the genetics I want. Um, so one of the reasons to raise them is to get the genetics I want, but the other reason to raise them is to make sure they're well, they're well fed and that I get a lot of queens. But I want to try and do it in a way that I don't tie up a lot of resources. Because what happens when I make that one hive queenless is I had this big strong hive, I made them queenless, and that big strong hive will feed the queen really well. I'll probably get a really good queen out of the deal, but I'm only going to get one queen. At the end of the day, or at the end of the 24 days, the first one out killed all the rest of them. That one is the one that finally goes out and mates, and now I've had this whole hive queenless for about 24 days, and I've got one laying queen out of the deal. So the object of the game is to get more queens, right? Well, they probably made 20 or 30 queen cells in a really good, strong hive when I made them queenless. It, it varied a lot. These do whatever they want, but, but that's a pretty good guess. And... Uh, I could have gotten a whole bunch of queen cells out of that, right? Now, I'm not necessarily recommending this, but if I took a little nuke and I made them queenless, I'd still end up with one queen. And I would have made a whole lot less bees queenless for a whole lot less time, and, and it would have set me back as far as my honey production and anything else I was hoping for a lot less, right? Because meanwhile, the, the main hive is still there, and it's still doing what it was doing, and, and I just may a little good clean those bees over here. The problem with this scenario is they may not get fed very well. I need them to get fed well, and to, in order to get them fed well, I need, lots, I need a high density of bees. And also, also, the higher the density of the bees, the more cells they'll make. So, um, basically, you know, if you read all these clean rearing books, most of these scenarios are trying to accomplish two things. One of them is you're trying to get the most amount of cleans with the least amount of resources. The other thing you'll often find, though, a lot of these guys were uh, professional queen breeders. That's what they were doing. And so they're also trying to get queens regardless of the circumstances. In other words, it's not just <coughs> swarm season. They still want to be raising queens in the middle of summer. They still want to be raising queens when there's a dearth. They still want to be raising queens, you know, going into the fall because there's still a market for them and they want to keep raising them. They're trying to get bees to raise them under less than the optimum circumstances is a little trickier. So some of these really complicated schemes are based on trying to get them to raise queens when it's not the optimum time. And, and I'm all for you learning more about that and trying to do that. But meanwhile, if we just want to talk about a backyard beekeeper who just wants a couple of queens, that's probably way more work than you want to do. And it's a lot easier just to pick the right time of year and, 
and, and set the right circumstances and get some cleans. So the other issue, of course, is to pick the stock you want. I would pick, um, I, I, I think it's always dangerous in any breeding program with any species to focus on specific traits and try to measure those traits and then breed for just those specific traits that you think somehow are going to enhance whatever your end goal is. You should look back off and look at the big picture and shoot for what your end goal is. For instance, if you want to raise racehorses, I think rather than trying to measure how long their legs are and how spindly they are and how small their hooves are and, and, and how big their chest is and how long their tail is and whatever, you should just race them. They do well, breed from those. Because I think you fool yourself into thinking you understand the big picture, and you probably don't. Um, in fact, they recently dug up a skeleton of one of the sires of the thoroughbreds that's like almost every thoroughbred is related to this. And he's supposed to be like the most marvelous uh, racehorse that ever lived. And they dug him up and they measured all of his proportions to try and decide what they should breed for to get this kind of an awesome racehorse. And he's absolutely average. <laughs> and that's because average is what has developed over the centuries as being the best for a horse to be able to run really well. And instead we assume we understand it and so we breed for longer legs and smaller hooves and spindlier bones and what we get is sickly horses that are crazy and, and break their legs a lot. Um, so I think we make the same mistake with bees. I think what you really ought to look at is the big picture. It's not that hard to judge the big picture. If you're raising bees and these bees are gentle and they're productive and they're the kind of bees you like, that's the bees you want to breed from. Um, if, they're, if they haven't survived the winter, it's probably a little too soon to judge that you want to raise bees from this queen. If they've survived the winter, and you've got a pretty good idea they can survive your winters. If they haven't survived the winter, you don't have a clue. I, wouldn't, I probably wouldn't be raising queens from that queen. Now, if you're desperate, you bought a package, raising queens from that queen at least has the advantage she'll breed with some of the drones out there, and you'll be a step closer to bees that can survive in your climate. And so that might be worth raising a couple just to kind of head in that direction. But all in all, if you want to raise a bunch of queens, I'd try and get some stock you really like that's doing well in your location under your circumstances. Um, and I don't think that's that hard to judge. You pretty much already know. If you go out to your hives, you know which hives you like. This hive, this hive is booming, it's strong, it's happy, it's, it's easy to get along with, it's making honey. That's the one you want to breed from. You don't want to breed from the one that's you know, barely, barely pulling along and and, and doesn't look like it's going to do very well. Um, that's kind of a whole other topic, the whole bee uh, thing. But um, so, where does a queen come from? Um, a queen just comes from a fertilized egg. Any fertilized egg can become a queen. Um, same as a worker, they come from any fertilized egg. The question is how they feed them and how they take care of them. So um, we need to fool them into raising some queens from the workers they've got. Now that's often done a lot of different ways. I'm going to just do some simple ones here, but um, a cell starter is where you're going to get them to start raising some queen cells. There's a lot of different ways to do this. I'm going to give you what I think is about the simplest. Um, the simplest is you take a good strong colony and you compress it. And by compress it I mean you take off any of the empty boxes and then you can start taking off some of the honey and shake all the bees back in there and take the honey and give it to somebody else or harvest it, whichever you want to do right now, depending on whether you want to get the kitchen all messed up today. Um, but compress it. Get it down to where the bees barely fit in the hive. If the bees will all fit in the hive, you're not compressed enough. You need to take some more boxes off. If you have to take a whole frame of brood off and shake all the bees off of that and give that box of brood to another hive, that's fine. Just keep compressing them down until you get them down to where they don't all fit in the hive anymore. If they all fit in the hive, it's not, compre it's not compressed enough. You want them crowded enough that they want to swarm. That's what you're trying to do, right? You want, them, you want them where they're crowded and they'll feed these queens really well and they'll raise a lot of cells. So I just keep crowding them down. And this can, like I said, you can put these resources on other hives, whatever you need to do, but you just keep compressing them down. Because the field bees are all going to keep coming back. And if you keep shaking the bees off the brood into that hive, they're going to stay there. And you can give them to some other hive and they'll start taking care of that brood, right? So we just keep compressing it down. So now we've got this compressed hive. And, and well, actually, I should, I should probably put this in the right sequence. The first thing I want to do is try and find the queen because she's going to be really hard to find after I compress it down. <laughs> I really want to find her and I want to take her out and stick her in a new. I just want to put her in a frame of brood and a frame of honey. And, if, I, if I'm going to compress them down another box of brood, I might give her some more of that brood. I don't know. 
but probably not because I want to shake the bees off and give them some other hive. But um, so I, I put her, in, I'll put that queen in a nuke somewhere because this is a, probably a good queen. I probably like her, or I wouldn't be breeding queens from her, right? Um, then I compress it down. Now, uh, now I've got them compressed down enough to make them basically one swarm plus the queenless. So they'll raise a whole bunch of queens and they'll feed them really well because there's lots of resources and lots of bees to take care of those queens. Does that make sense? Yeah, this is pretty much what I'd do even if I was going to graft. Because if I do that, I've got, a, I've got a nice scenario to get a lot of queens raised. Um, there are some arguments over emergency queens. There's people who believe that if you just do a walk away split and you let them raise their own queen, that that queen's somehow going to be inferior. That that queen's somehow not going to be as good. And the main argument is that they'll start with too young of a larva. Um, I don't think that's true. This is Jay Smith's comment on the, on the idea that emergency queens aren't as good. Um, basically what happens uh, is they, they s if they start with a comb that has a lot of cocoons in it, and they're trying to take this larva and turn it into a queen, they end up floating it out to the mouth because they can't tear them down very easily, and so then they build a queen cell out here on the face of the comb. If they, if they could tear the wall down, they would. So if you have a frame of new comb in there that's full of eggs, you can set the scenario where they can tear the walls down, and, they, and that's not an issue. Now whether that's a, worth worrying about or not, I don't know. I usually don't worry about it. But if you're worried about it, you can do that. You can just put a new frame, a frame of drawn new comb that doesn't have any cocoons in there about three or four days before you decide you're going to crowd them down like this, and the queen will have laid that all full of eggs, and they can easily tear those walls down, and you'll have the right age larva on some new comb. Mm -hmm. The other option is to do the maldisal comb method, where you go in and you just find the right age larva, and you tear down the walls for them. You go in there and you find some young larva, and you just rip the wall on the, on the, on the gravity, we'll call it the bottom side. It's actually the side of the cell, because what we usually call the bottom of the cell is, is horizontally into the middle, you know, it's on the mid-rib is what we usually call the bottom of the cell, but you're tearing the wall off on the lower side of the cell, and, and you just tear it down two or three, you know, just rip it off. You, you could take a ink pen like this and just tear it, and then they can easily rework that and build a queen cell on that. Um, that's how well, this will kind of do it. Um, me, I just make them queenless and let them sort it out. But then I'm lazy. Um, Cecil Miller and Moses Quimby basically say the same thing, that they won't start with too old of a larva. Quimby also said that if you start with new comb, they can easily tear it down and build a, a cell. People are always asking me where I got this thing. This is actually out of uh, this little thing on the right, lower right-hand corner is from uh, Doolittle's Scientific Clean Rearing, which you can read for free on my website, or you can buy it in... Uh, that um, clean rearing, classic clean rearing compendium. Uh, do a little books in there. But anyway, you could probably download that off my website. It's, a, it's just a JPEG. But what it is is a way to keep track of the timing. You just stick a pin in here and bend it over, and you put the head on on the day of the month here. And you put this in, and you put it on the month here, and you put the pen here and bend it over. And you can put it on the current state of the mating nuke, you know, is it, does it have eggs, approved, cell, hatch, not approved, approved, laying, missing. So in other words, when I first put the cell in, I'll put it on cell. And then if I come back and the cell is emerged and it's not dead, it's still in the cell, then it's hatched, right? Uh, not really scientifically accurate, but it's emerged actually because the egg hatched, you know, 16 days ago. But, but or 14 days, uh, 12 days ago. But anyway. Um, and then this is this is the it's a little, I saw some eggs. Maybe I haven't seen a queen yet. Um, this is that it's missing. I didn't, couldn't find a queen at all. I couldn't find any evidence of a queen. This would be I have a laying queen. This is actually she's been laying long enough. I've decided she's a good queen and I've approved her. This is she's been laying long enough. And I've decided I don't think she's that good, so I'm not going to approve her. So you just kind of move the pins around. So it's just like a straight pin stuck in here and bent over. And then yeah. What would, at this stage, make you, so soon, make you uh, figure that it was not a crude queen? 
Um, I'd, I'd let them wait a little while before I made that decision, but if, if she's been laying in there for two or three weeks and she's just kind of got brood scattered here and there and it's not all in, consolidated in one place and there's a lot of gaps in it, then it's, she's probably not going to be a very good queen. One of the things that happens if you, have, if you do get too much inbreeding, um, which is not impossible, but I think it's unlikely because so much of the uh, biology is, is stacked, the deck's stacked to try and end up with genetic diversity, but if you get too much inbreeding, the, the sex determination alleles in a bee are such that a, uh, if it's too inbred, you end up with a diploid drone. In other words, you end up with a drone that has two sets of genes, but the alleles match. If the alleles match, or there's only one set of alleles, it's a male. So if it's, di if it's a haploid, which is normal, an unfertilized egg, then it's always a drone. But if it's a diploid and the alleles match, then you end up with a haploid, uh, with a diploid drone, and the bees just clean them out. And so what you end up with is all these, a lot of gaps in the, in the brood nest, and that would basically be a queen I'd consider too inbred, and I don't want to mess with her. Um, but I haven't really seen that happen very often. Once in a while you get a queen over just doesn't ever lay. It rained too much, she never got out in May. She just, yeah. she's been in there for three weeks and she's not laying yet, and I usually figure it's not gonna happen. Um, but yeah, you're, you're, they're looking, he's, he's, Doolittle's looking at the lane pattern, is a good lane pattern. Um, here's some B math just so you understand. So let's say, let's say I make this hive queenless. The day I make it queenless, I'm trying to track the, the age of the egg. This is four days before the egg got laid, right? But I made it queenless on this day, they're going to start with that egg that's four days old. Um, so this is the day I'm going to go in there and compress it down. One of the things I need to do really when I do that is look for queen cells. Because if there's already queen cells in there, actually I probably ought to just put those in some mating hoops and call it good and I've got some queens. But um, the problem is if I'm planning on them raising more queens, my timing's all off if I don't find these cells. Because the first one out's going to kill all the rest of them and I'm not going to come back here to do what I'm going to do until this day. And if these were two or three days ahead, and I, I end up losing all my queen cells. So I want to make sure there's no queen cells in here. And then 14 days after I made them queenless, I'm going to put those in the mating nukes. Now, you can make them up that day or you can make them up the day before. You either want to make them up like nine, this is basically 10 days after you made it queenless, right? So nine days after would be a good day to set up mating nukes, or you can make them up that day. Um, one good way to do it would be to go make them up that morning and then put the queen cells in them that afternoon. That way there's less time that they're queenless and, and likely to get in trouble getting robbed or whatever, because the robbers always seem to sense that the hive's queenless. Um, the sooner I get a queen cell in here, the, more, the sooner they start acting like they're not queenless. So um, basically nine days after I can set up the main use or ten days after, and then on the tenth day I need to put the queen cells in there. In theory, she's going to emerge on day 16. In hot weather, that could be day 15. In cool weather, that could be day 17. But um, that's my goal. I have done this on day 14 and have been emerging already, and then it gets exciting. Um, there's a virgin running around here, another one emerging here, and another one popping out here, and you're trying to catch them all. On. Um, but this is a pretty good, pretty good bet. On day 14, I'm going to be able to do this and not have them emerging yet. So let's 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 just do the step by step one real quick. You got you got um, you made this hive queen unless they start building a bunch of queen cells from a four day old larva that's just hatched. In other words, the egg got laid four days ago. It's already hatched. They start with the one that's just hatched, and they start making queen cells. So they start with and they might make twenty queen cells. So we got like twenty queen cells maybe getting started. And then 10 days later, those queen cells are now at day 14 from when the egg was laid, and they're going to merge on day 16, right? So now I've been, I need someplace to put these cells so that when the first one emerges, it doesn't kill all of them, right? So the concept of a mating nuke is that I'm going to set up a little, a little hive just to get a queen mated. Now, you don't have to do that. If you have hives you want to put these queens in, you can just put the queen cell in the hive you want the queen in and let her emerge in that hive. There's nothing wrong with that plan. 
It's just that you may or may not have a hive you want to put her in right now. You may want to have her around for a spare for later, in which case you may want to put her in a mating. Or maybe you want to get her mated and get her laying and give her to somebody else or sell her to somebody else or whatever it is you want to do with her. So the idea of a mating is just to minimize the amount of resources being used to get her mated. Where if you just want to requeen these hives, you can just take a bunch of cells and put them in the hives you want to requeen and not even bother to find the old queen. Just put the put the cells in there, she'll emerge, and odds are they'll get they'll they'll have a supersedure. She'll take over. And the old queen will get disposed of because she doesn't make it enough pheromones. The new queen's gonna make a lot better pheromones. When she first emerges, she's making almost none, which is why she gets ignored. She flies out and mates and comes back and starts laying. Now she's making a lot of pheromones and now she's the better queen and so they eventually get rid of the old one. So um, you can just do that if you have some place you want this queen or you can put her in a mating to get her mated and have her around for later. <coughs> so I'll talk a little more about mating nukes in a minute here. But um, you can buy these little mini mating nukes and the theory is that you can just use a cup full of bees and get a queen mated. My experience is it's pretty problematic getting a cup full of bees thrown in a little box to stay there. <laughs> they have no comb, they have no... Now once you're in a, if you're a queen breeder, you'll have a whole bunch of drawn comb to put in there. That helps some, but, but brood helps even more. So to me, the ideal mating nuke is one that take, takes my brood frames, it might happen to be mediums, and holds at least two frames. And two frames is really about perfect for me because I don't want to spend more res more resources than I have to, but um, I need to be able to give them at least a frame of brood and a frame of honey so that they've got brood to keep them anchored there and a frame of honey to give them something to eat and feed this queen because they're going to have no field bees because all the bees are going to, all the field bees are going to fly back to the old hive. So what a, ideally my mating nuke would be a, a, a whatever my brood frames are, which is a medium of brood, a medium of honey, and then I'll shake in another frame that had brood on it to shake the bees in there just so I've got some extra bees to make up for the ones that are going to drift back to the hive. So um, that's my mating. And, and they won't leave because there's brood there. Please so they stay. It. Is it half brood or open brood? Does it matter? I, I don't worry about it too much. Open brood will do more to keep them there, but um, okay. either one will keep them there pretty much. The advantage to the emerging brood is that they will soon emerge and, and help this population out, which is helpful. But the advantage of the open brood is it tends to anchor more of them there because they're busy feeding them. So, on the other hand, the calf brood requires more resources because they have to feed them, and the calf brood doesn't require as much resources. I don't really worry about it because I'm usually setting up 200 of them at a time, so I just, yeah. it's a frame of brood that's good enough for me. Um, but I, if I was being more picky, which would I prefer? I don't know. Uh, it's kind of a trade off, yeah. Um, this, this is a mini ma mating nuke from <coughs> Jay Smith's book, Tiny. His, his view of mini mating nukes is basically that usually the queen goes out to mate and the bees go with her and they never come back. That's his <laughs> view. Um, they, look at, they look at that and, and they, when they leave, they don't even look behind them. It's, it's, they're not coming back to that. It's, it's not these are my typical mating nukes. These are actually 10 frame. They were 10 frame deep boxes originally um, that were calls, and then I cut them down to seven and a quarter. Um, so I wouldn't need a bottom board, and I'd just put a piece of plywood on the bottom, and then I, I put one buys in here. But if you put one buys in here and divide it up into four two frame nukes, it's kind of crowded. If I was doing it again, I'd use quarter inch Luan, which is skinnier, and it'd give me a little more room in there to get a cell in. Because as it is, it's really crowded. I have trouble getting two frames and a cell in there, especially if the honey frame's a little fat in places, which it often is. It's really hard to get it in there sometimes. But, but that's what most of mine are. It's got a hole here for this one to come out. It's got a hole here for this one, a hole here for this one, and a hole over here for this one. And this is canvas. And the canvas keeps them from spilling over from this side to this side. When you open this up, to put a queen cell in or take the queen out or look at this hive, they'll start spilling over to the other side if there isn't something to keep them from getting in this hive. You could build this, you could make these out of plywood. You could have a little plywood lid for each of them, but the canvas was cheap and it was you know, available. Canvas works fine and plywood works fine. Um, I think if I was doing them again, since I'm all eight frame boxes anyway, I'd probably divide an eight frame box into thirds and 
make little plywood ones. It might be more convenient. I don't know. But I probably won't do that until these totally fall apart, but they're on their way. I don't know. I think getting older over here. Just like all of us, I guess. Um, you can see more of them over here. Now what I do is I, I have a ready, um, it's called a Burks Ready Date New Calendar, I think is the name of it. It basically is just push pins. You put a push pin on it to hold it on the hive, and then it's got a it's got the the number of the day from one to thirty-one that you can put a pin in for for keeping track of the day, and then it's got a an X and an L and a C and a V and an O, which the, the X is uh, that it's queenless, and the V is that there's a virgin queen in there, and the C is there's a cell in there, and the, the L is there's a land queen in there, and so I can keep track of where, what's in there right now, what I know at the current time. So I try to follow my batches through with the day I expect the queen to be laying. So I'll pick that date on the, on the <coughs> starter hive, and then when I set up these mating weeks, I'll put that same date on all of them, and then that's the date I expect to come back here and find a laying queen. Um, but you can pick whatever date you want, and as long as you're consistent and you can do the math to figure out where you're going. You can even get two different colored pens. Put one in there for like uh, when you expect her to merge, and another one for when you expect her to be laying. And, and you know, if, you, if the red one is um, she emerges, and the blue one is that she's laying, and you know, you could keep track of it that way. But um, you need some way to keep track of the dates on these, because otherwise you'll you won't know what to expect. You'll come here, and there'll be a queen running around there, and she's not laying, and you don't know. Should she be laying, or, or, or what? Because sometimes the queen never lays. Sometimes she just wanders around there and never flies off and mates and never, never lays. Now, if you raise a whole bunch of queens, you don't know what to do with them. You can bank them. Um, there are a few tricks. I'll tell you what I've learned over the years. I generally try not to bank them. Um, it seems to me it's more natural to have them laying until they're moved somewhere else and they're laying. And, not have them bank, but sometimes you end up with a whole bunch of queens and you have you don't have enough mating hoops to keep them all in, and you got to put them somewhere. But if you catch them, in, if you catch a whole bunch of them and put them in cages at the same time, you can bank all of these as a group, and it'll work pretty well. But if you catch them on different days and put them in there, it doesn't work very well. Basically, you want them all to have equal pheromones, pretty much. They were all laying yes today when you caught them, and now you're going to put them in the bank, and and the bank will take care of them. So we're going to set up a bank. I'll take a frame of brood from this hive and this hive and this hive and this hive. So I got like maybe four frames of open brood and a couple of frames of honey that I grabbed while I was at it. So now I got bees from four different hives and they're queenless and they're in this little eight frame medium box because that's what I, that's my standard box, not because it's nothing magic about it. If I ran all ten frame deeps, I'd use a ten frame deep box, but um, but I run all eight frame medium. So I got eight frames of bees here and I left enough room to put the frame with the queens on it in the middle. I'll, let, I'll leave them queenless probably overnight, but at least a couple hours. And then I'll put all those queens in at the same time. And then they usually do just fine. As long as I don't ever add any new queens, they'll be fine. I can take queens out as I go along until I run out of queens. But I never put any new queens in. If I put a new queen in, they'll kill all the old queens and they'll keep the new queens. Um, I think it's just that they sense these new queens have really great pheromones and those suck. <laughs> so because they haven't been laying, their pheromones drop off when they're not laying. When that's the only queens they have in there, they're perfectly happy with them, but when you put some queens in there that have a lot of pheromones, then they, they tend to get rid of those. Now, that doesn't make a lot of sense. I, I, give you, I give you that as an explanation, but they usually seem to raise a queen, even though I've got all these queens in here. Because I've got some brood in there, and there's bees in there, but they tend to raise another queen. Um, probably because these aren't walking around in the comb leaving their tarsal pheromones everywhere, so they feel like they still need one. So they'll raise another queen, and they still don't seem to kill those bees. I always figured if they raise another queen, they'd kill all those bees. But I do tend to keep an eye on them, and when they raise a new queen, I catch her and put her in another nuke. And, 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 and they, usually by then she's laid a whole bunch of eggs, and they raise another queen from that one, and I catch her and put her in another nuke. Um, but meanwhile, as long as I don't add any more queens there, and I keep catching the queens they raise and taking them out, they seem to be fine, um, in case you want to thank queens. Um, the one in the upper right hand corner I bought from Honey Run Apiaries, um, but basically those, he just built a frame and sold me all of it, but you can buy those, those trays 
from uh, Man Lake as well as those Daisy Easy cages. And it's a plastic cage. Probably most of you have seen one, maybe you haven't. It's a plastic cage, and, and that tray will actually hold like two rows across, and then and you got two trays. So it'll hold like 180 queens in one frame. So you can put 180 queens in that mate and, and earn that bank, and, and they do pretty well. The one on the left hand side there is more homemade. Um, in cages. A lot of people just take a dowel and wrap a um, number eight hardware cloth around it and then kind of sew it together either with wire or whatever to make it into a round cage and then stick a cork in both ends and you've got a queen cage. You can pull the cork out of one end, run the queen in, put the cork back in the other, back in the end, and you've got a queen in the cage, right? I've also seen people take a, oh, a piece that looks about like a screen molding. It's about three quarters of an inch wide and and three-eighths of an inch thick, and they'll wrap it around that, and then they'll cut that into pieces and use it for corks at both ends. So it, it's the same concept, except it's more flat and wide. Um, I don't know that it has any advantage over being round, but that's how people do it. So just at the very bottom, to running out of young bees to feed the queens, that's what the queens are eating. Well, it's, it's young bees usually that make the entourage that are taking care of the queens, and so... Oh, to feed the queens up. So it kind of depends on how this goes. If they raise another queen, which seems to be what happens to me most often, then it, it's not really an issue because she lays it all up and they raise some more brood. But I don't want them to run out of young nurse bees who want to feed and take care of the queen. So if, if they don't raise a new queen, I'll stick another frame of brood in there with the nurse bees on the brood so that they'll go take care of the queen. I have one question. Uh, that queen that they do raise, having all those bank queens there, and knowing that you have, when that queen emerges and it wants to go kill those queens, will we find that queen with the bank? Or is she just... Um, well, I, honestly, I think there's a big misconception about what a, what virgin queens do and what lane queens do. Um, he's asking what, you know, won't that new queen they raise try and go kill all those queens. Um, virgin queens are looking for virgin queens to kill. Okay. Um, they don't seem that interested in laying queens. They're looking for virgin queens to kill. And laying queens don't care two hoots about any other queen. They really don't care. Like, you put two laying queens together, they don't fight. They don't, they, they just, that's what, how people run lay, uh, two queen hives all the time. But the laying queens aren't really looking for anybody to kill. It's that, it's that virgin queen when she first emerges who's looking for any other virgin queen in the hive to kill. And these aren't virgin queens, so I think, yeah, it's never been an issue. Um, I, I think there's a lot of mis, uh, misunderstanding about that. Who is it? Andy? I'm trying to think what the guy's name is. I should look that up. A uh, guy named Andy something wrote a bunch of stuff that's on B Source. One of the, he talks about some of the myths of beekeeping. One of them is he says that, that, that if you put two queens together, they'll fight. So he tried this several times to try and you know show people how cool it would be. So he takes he takes a couple of cages of laying queens and he lets the queens out, puts them on the they're both clips so they won't fly off, and he puts them on the table so they'll fight to the death, right? And they just they just run from each other or ignore each other. You know they're not the least bit interested in fighting. Um, laying queens just aren't interested in fighting, and virgin queens are really only I think only interested in killing virgins. I don't know if they're that interested in killing uh, laying queens. So, yeah, it doesn't seem to be a problem. <coughs> um, that's my email address. Um, since I put all these on my website, I can code it like that so that the spam bots don't find it and start sending me a thousand emails a day. I'm just selling me all sorts of things I have no interest in, um, which are pretty disgusting. Um, and that's, uh, that's the book. Um, any questions? I do have one question to follow up. To follow up on that with the mating queens that are won't fight each other. If you have two, uh, if you have two hives that are weak and you put them together, will both those queens, one of those queens, will not go try to kill the other one. They'll try to get the brood built up. Yeah, they'll, they'll tend to dispose of one usually, but I think the workers do that. I don't think the I don't think the queens do that. I think the workers just decide which one they want to keep, get rid of the other one. Um, and sometimes that happens right away, and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes they do keep both queens, and both queens lay for a while, and eventually they get rid of one. 
usually eventually they get rid of one. I mean, the general rule that there's one queen in a hive is a good general rule. It just isn't a specific rule because sometimes there are two queens in a hive. But it's usually a temporary situation that might last three or four months or it might last three or four days or it might last three or four hours. But um, in general, they'll eventually get rid of one. But people, are, people do two queen hives all the time with two queens in there and they get a little late through the main buildup, and then usually one of them gets disposed of eventually if you give everybody access to everything. But if you can keep them separated enough, sometimes you can keep the bees confused enough that they don't know what to do, but, and maybe keep them two queen, with two queens for longer, but yeah. I've read that in uh, Germany there was a beekeeper who had was able to raise hives with five or multiple queens. Wait a minute, nobody can hear you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I was asking about the um, German beekeeper that was able to raise um, hives with multiple queens, but I can't find any research or anything on it. Do you? Do you have any information? I, I have paid much two queen hives. I've run two queen hives on several occasions. He was um, running like six, five or six or something. Two queens was big enough problem to do and they and they got booming enough that they were bigger than I wanted to deal with. So I don't know why you want five or six. I don't know what you gain. But but two queens you end up with a booming population really fast. And and actually I think it may be that the it may be that the pheromones that the queen produced has more of an effect than how many eggs they're laying because a queen can lay an amazing amount of eggs a day. And usually the, con the, the controlling factor of how much brood they raise is how much brood they can take care of, not how many eggs the queen can lay. I think having two queens, it may be more a question of the bees are addicted to QNP, and you give them more QNP, it motivates them more. You know? and, and that's my theory, but I've run some two queen hives. The other problem with the theory of a two queen hive is if, if, is if the whole theory is that this, this causes them to raise more brood, my timing of when I can get two queens and get the two queen hive going isn't consistent with when I would need to do that to get that to make the difference. What seems to make the difference, I think, is the pheromones. I'm just guessing. I don't know. Uh, but I've run two queen hives several times. I've got a page on the topic. Um, I think the simplest way is to get a long hive long enough that you can put a stack of uh, boxes over here for this queen, and you've got a queen excluder here, and a stack of boxes over here for this queen, and a queen excluder <coughs> here. So you've got this like almost four foot long um, box here, four, 48 and 3 quarters inches, and then you can put a stack of supers in the middle, where neither queen can get to the middle. So you've got the stack in the middle that's just the supers, and the stacks on the ends that are the brood nests, and you can manipulate it any way you want without having to unstack it. When I ran a two queen hive with, I've done them a bunch of different ways. I've done them with a 12 frame box and an and a, and a excluder down the middle where this side was one queen and this side was the other queen, and that that was hard to manage because you had to remove all the supers to get down to it. You got this blooming hive that's making tons of honey, and you got to move the honey every time you want to go see what's going on. And then you've got the, the you could put a stack here with the queen, a stack here with the queen, and a stack in the middle with some supers with excluders on these two and a board on the side to cover it. That's another method. But again, the supers are in the way. You got to remove the supers to get the bee. So the method I came up with, I liked the best, was the long one. And, and a, and divide it into thirds with the excluders this way, and then I can stack up a brood nest and a brood nest and supers, and I don't have to. I can get to anything without having to unstack everything. But it's still a pain in the. It's a pain in the butt. It's easier to run three hives and get the same amount. Of <laughs> yes. So I want to back up, back up, back up, because I'm pretty new. I have two hives. Is there a minimum number of hives you need to have to raise queens? Making queen lists are going to raise a bunch of queens. Okay. And except for the mating nukes, they're not going to kill each other. So, okay. sure, you could do it too high. So, it wouldn't matter, the genetic diversity is not, I mean, you don't have to have it. And we have people in the neighborhood, too. So. There's drones out there, and they're, basically what, what happens is, there's no cut and dried rule. I know everybody likes cut and dried rules, but pretty much there aren't any with these, so I give up on those. But, pretty much the, the drones tend to fly three quarters of a mile away on the average for a drone congregation area, and the queens tend to fly a couple of miles to go mate. And so what usually happens is the queen goes someplace further away than the drones from that yard to go mate. Does she always? No, she doesn't always. She might mate with the bees from her colony. But the, the deck is stacked so that the odds are she'll mate with some other drones. So it probably isn't going to be an issue. I used I had between about two and four hives and raised all my own queens for 
decades, and I never saw any problems with inbreeding. So, if that answers that, yeah. Hi, I was hoping you would back up even further, just a little bit further, because um, I'm confused. I'm hearing that it, and I'm getting from what you're talking about that it's important maybe to have local queens. And on the other hand, if we get the queens, like a package from somewhere else in California, say, and they're going to come out here to Washington State and become localized anyway, what's Let's talk Give about me. become localized. The way bees become localized is the ones who can't survive in your climate die. That's how they get. That's how they get acclimatized. They die. <laughs> the ones that live are the ones that can live in your climate, and those are acclimatized. So it's not. It's not like they get used to the climate. That's not what happens. So how long did it take for them to become? They either they either have the they either have the right genetics to live here or they don't. And if they don't, they die. Okay. So so the ones that survive a winter have a good chance of surviving the next winter. Okay. The ones that don't survive the winter, it's probably, obviously, they're not going to survive the next winter. <laughs> so, it's, it's, so, just a, so I hear you say that it's not, it's not something that just happens. They get used to the weather or something in a few no, weeks. No, they don't just get used to the weather. No. Okay. You know, it's pretty much the ones who aren't acclimatized die. Okay. Yeah. Well, Stand by. I can talk loud. I don't know. I think what I've seen, well, I'm not buying packages anymore, but in the past, and I was, you know, a new beekeeper, those bees that I get in the package would supersede that queen almost right away and make their own queen. And, those, and a lot of those bees would survive through the winter. Um, you know, and then I would not have a more queen in there after a couple of weeks. So. You know, if they're gonna they're gonna do that, and they seem to be doing that more and more that they supersede those queens that we get from California because they're not good queens. Right. So, and they are breeding with whatever. They do become um, climated because the genetics from that those drones, those queens that are mating with, are hopefully local bees right. and survive our climate. So it can happen without them totally dying off if they replace that queen. Sure, and they often do. Right. Because those queens are terrible. Yeah, <laughs> and they do. Basically. I mean, like, that's what we hear from a lot of new beekeepers. Like, I don't have a more queen. Right. Yeah, she's gone. Okay, I think it's time for lunch. <laughs> yeah.